Good morning and welcome to this virtual church service at Maple Grove United Church. It's terrific to have you with us watching remotely. Whenever and wherever you're sharing in this service, we give thanks for your time and your worship. And we pray that this opportunity to connect with your faith brings you closer to God. A special thanks to the Chancel Choir under the direction of Dr. Deborah Henry, accompanied by Ian Sadler. Thanks to our volunteers, Gord Penley and Joan Vinyl Cox, who will be reading in today's service. As well, thanks for the vital technical support of John Duffin and Joan Vinyl Cox. Enjoy the service and God bless. As we come together, we acknowledge this land called Turtle Island that was inhabited long before the settlers arrived and displaced the indigenous peoples and their communities. We are gathered on the traditional territories of many different First Nations people. Their relationship with the land is at the centre of their lives and spirituality. We acknowledge and give thanks for their stewardship of this land throughout the ages. We make this acknowledgement to remember the healing work that is before us, which we pray will lead us into reconciliation with our Indigenous brothers and sisters. Let us prepare our hearts and homes for worship by listening to Nimrod from Enigma Variations by Sir Edward Elgar.
Please join with me in the call to worship. God of courage and determination, strengthen us when we stumble. Speak to us today your words of hope. God of comfort and compassion, sustain us in times of trial. Share with us today your words of peace. God of loyalty and faithfulness, guide us to know your path for us. Inspire us today through your words of love. Let us pray the opening prayer. God of peace, we remember today the immensity of the cost of war. We remember those who served fearfully, uncertainly, and faithfully. We remember prisoners of war, enduring torture and neglect, contempt and shame. With gratitude, we will remember. God of love, we remember all the victims of war, military and civilian, regardless of the side they fought on. We remember those who died or were injured, who sacrificed their lives to protect our freedom. We remember those whose lives or homes were destroyed. With sorrow, we will remember. God of hope, we pray for peace in our world. Comfort those who still suffer the effects of war. Sustain those who live in countries torn apart by violence and strengthen those who work for peace. With courage, we will remember. In Jesus' name we pray, who made the ultimate sacrifice to redeem each one of us. Amen. Let us lift up our voices in song renewing our faith and strengthening our relationship with God through God's gift of music and praise. Our opening hymn is for the healing of the nations, Voices United, 678. <laughs>
scripture today is from Ruth 1, 1 to 22. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land, and a certain man of Bethlehem and Judah went to live in the country of Moab, he and his wife and two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife, Naomi. And the names of his two sons were Malon and Chilion, and they were Ephraelites from Bethlehem in Judah. They went into the country of Moab and remained there. But Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, died, and she was left with her two sons. These took Moabite wives. The name of the one was Orpah, and the name of the other, Ruth. When they had lived there about 10 years, both Malon and Chilion also died, so that the women were left without her two sons and her husband. Then she started to return with her daughters-in-law from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the country of Moab that the Lord had considered his people and given them food. So she set out from the place where she had been living, she and her two daughters-in-law, and they went on their way to go back to the land of Judah. But Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, go back each of you to your mother's house, May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you may find security, each of you in the house of your husband. Then she kissed them and they wept aloud. They said to her, no, we will return with you to your people. But Naomi said, turn back my daughters, why will you go with me? Do I still have sons in my womb that they may become your husbands? Turn back, my daughters, go your way, for I am too old to have a husband. Even if I thought there was hope for me, even if I should have a husband tonight and bear sons, would you wait then till they were grown? Would you then refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, it has been far more bitter for me than for you because the hand of the Lord has turned against me. Then they wept aloud again. Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. So she said, see your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, do not press me to leave you or to turn back from following you. Where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. There will I be buried. May the Lord do thus and so to me and more as well, if even death parts us, parts me from you. When Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she said no more to her. So the two of them went on until they came to Bethlehem. When they came to Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. And the women said, is this Naomi? She said to them, call me no longer Naomi. Call me Mara, for the Almighty has dealt bitterly with me. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi when the Lord has dealt harshly with me and the Almighty has brought calamity upon me? So Naomi returned together with Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law, who came back with her from the country of Moab. Then they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest. May the Lord bless these words from God's scripture. The war is ended. A diary entry from the front lines in Europe following the armistice. We know the day and hour when the armistice was to go into effect. 
the 11th at 11 o'clock. Everyone in camp was wondering whether the Germans would stop firing. The barrage was heavier than any artillery fire I had even seen and heard since I'd been in France. And as an ambulance driver and stretcher bearer, I have heard some heavy duels indeed. This was about a quarter to 11 o'clock. Shells were falling everywhere. Guns were roaring. 10 minutes of 11 and still the guns roared on, unmindful of the fact that the peace was imminent. Five minutes of 11 and everyone was showing signs of nervousness. Then, as suddenly as though God himself had dropped a wet blanket over the crackling flames of hell, and at one blow had extinguished them all, the firing and rumbling immediately ceased. There was an instant pause in which it seemed as though the world had come to an end. Then, from the bells of an old cathedral, pealed forth silver tones that once again were saying, Peace on earth. My heart was in my mouth, for I was joyously and deliriously leaping about, yelling, shouting, and singing. Then I ran for the old cathedral. The roof was open to heaven because the German uh, shells had destroyed it. There in that ruined place, I knelt with hundreds of others. I knelt with hands clasped, eyes toward heaven, and prayed as I had never prayed before. I thought of home, a mother who would hold me in her arms and cry a bit, and then go to see I had my favorite dinner, dessert for dinner. A father who would say huskily, son, it's good to see you again. And last but not least, I was thinking of those rows and rows of graves in Flanders fields. Our brothers who died for liberty, asleep there between the crosses, row on row. The victory is won. The war is over and they sleep in Flanders fields and we are to go home. It was supposed to be the war to end all wars. The Great War, over by Christmas, a matter of months, when instead it endured for four grueling years, redefining military combat and reshaping countries, challenging ideals of patriotism, nationhood and loyalty, has been over 100 years since the end of the First World War, the end of four years of unimaginable conflict that cost the lives of over 65,000 Canadian soldiers, some 20,000 never accounted for. People who were prepared to give up their lives in the name of peace loving without counting the cost. Yet with over 40 active war zones around the world, it's difficult to pretend we have learned much from the horror of World War I. We have leapt to fight for the most dubious of causes, oil or regime manipulation. And we have stood on the sidelines while genocide, rape, and torture take place. And so, how do we reconcile the conflicting emotions that Remembrance Day evokes? How do we acknowledge the atrocities of war while mourning those we lost and honoring the sacrifices made? How do we pledge to stand for peace while recognizing that there are times when resistance is needed. Where can we find God when the world tries to tear itself apart? In our reading this morning, Naomi asks this same question. Where is God? What is God doing? Her pain and distress spill out from the scripture. The hand of the Lord has turned against me, she cries. The Almighty has brought calamity upon me. 
I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. The reading itself doesn't adequately portray the upheaval and destruction Naomi was living through. That first phrase, in the days when the judges ruled, masks a world of anarchy and chaos. Warlords and kings battled for power. Violence and civil disruption were the norm. And then famine struck, forcing families to leave their homes and their land to keep food on the table. But moving from Bethlehem to the country of Moab was a desperate step. Moab was a vicious and vindictive enemy of Israel. And so when we pick up Naomi's story today, Naomi has already been through considerable hardship to provide for her family. Losing her husband would have been a bitter blow, but with two sons to support her and the prospect of their families to come, all was not lost. And then tragedy strikes and both Naomi's sons die. Now she is alone, left at the mercy of an unforgiving world that did not care for childless widows. No wonder her thoughts have soured. No wonder Naomi wants to reject even her name, to throw away any memory of happiness. Every part of her life that had been cause for joy or satisfaction has been taken from her. Like Naomi, it is easy to feel bitter about the ordeal that was World War I, to lament the horrible irony that to begin with, Canadian troops worried that the war would be over before they could travel to Europe. All the heroism and adventure ended before they could take their share. If only. Instead, there was far too much time for the troops to, to suffer the interminable oozing mud, the relentless shelling, and the new and diabolical threat of poison gas. Canadian soldiers were at the front lines when the Germans first deployed this tactic. Soldier A.T. Hunter remembers a strange greenish-yellow fog, an odd sight on an otherwise sunny April day. It drifted slowly, almost gently, towards the Allied forces gathered itself like a wave and spilled over into the trenches. The soft and quiet approach concealed the fatal intent. Hunter describes a burning sensation in the head, red hot needles in the lungs, the throat seized as by a strangler. Many simply fell and died on the spot. And the suffering wasn't limited to the trenches. The devastation of the war spread far beyond the front lines as the drawn out fighting created countless refugees, widows and orphans. One war widow, married only three years, expressed the all consuming sense of despair. I felt that I didn't want to live. I'd no wish to live at all because the world had come to an end then for me because I'd lost all that I'd loved. Words that could have been said by Naomi centuries earlier in her despair. But Naomi was not alone, not abandoned. 
In her bleakest moment, she is given a most unexpected companion, her daughter-in-law, Ruth. Naomi has been clear about how conventionally unwise staying with her would be. And we read of Naomi's other daughter-in-law, Orpah, modelling the expected sensible choice and returning to Moab. But Ruth stayed put. No, more than stayed, Ruth clung to Naomi. Ruth clung to Naomi with a faithfulness and determination that defies logic as she utters one of the most beautiful statements of loyalty in the Bible. Where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. Your people shall be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. There will I be buried. It's a powerful and evocative pledge. And many of you may have heard this scripture read previously at weddings. But Ruth isn't making this statement at a joyous celebration. This isn't a for better day. It is most definitely for worse. And there's no reason to expect the women's fortunes to change. And yet Ruth clings to Naomi. Ruth pledges an unfathomable loyalty, gives her entire future over to be determined by this act of love and faithfulness. Ruth has no way of knowing what lies ahead in Bethlehem, no way of knowing if she will be accepted as Naomi's family or rejected as a foreigner, an intruder from one of Israel's fiercest enemies. But these are the circumstances in which loyalty can most clearly be seen precisely when it is most severely tested. You can see in Ruth's loyalty to Naomi, an expression of God's unwavering loyalty to humankind, an overflowing love that will never leave us, never abandon us. As God does not abandon Ruth, and has not, despite Ruth, despite Naomi's bitter complaints, abandoned Naomi either. For as our reading ends, with the two women heading into an unknown future, there is the first glimpse of hope. Listen again to verse 22. So Naomi returned from Moab accompanied by Ruth, her daughter-in-law, arriving in Bethlehem as the barley harvest was beginning. The harvest, food, survival, nourishment, the replenishment and filling up of a barren existence. There is light, hope, glimmering in the future. Theologian Frederick Beekner hinted at these glimmers of hope when he said, War is hell, but sometimes in the midst of that hell, men do things that heaven itself must be proud of. Amidst the barbarity and horror of the events of World War I, we can still find acts of loyalty that affirm Ruth's promise of faithfulness. Where you go, I will go. Where you die, I will die. There will I be buried. For Canada, it became a case of your war will be our war. As the fledgling nation committed itself to fight, bound by ties of loyalty to the British Empire. There was an alternative. 
as the cloud of gas hit the front lines on that April day, as the French troops fired helplessly into the drifting cloud of death, their Algerian conscripts broke away and ran. This had not been their war to begin with. This wasn't their land. These weren't their people. They threw away their rifles and raced, gasping, crying, trying to stay ahead of the deadly cloud, which was moving around six miles an hour, about as fast as a fit man could run. Meanwhile, outnumbered two to one, terrified by the bewildering decimation of the neighboring trenches, the Canadians held their ground. Where you stay, I will stay. Where you die, I will die. The Allied line had been split apart by the gas attack. The Canadian forces were outflanked and in danger of being obliterated by their own gun stations, now occupied by the Germans. Yet throughout the following night, Without artillery support, the Canadian forces stubbornly counterattacked, bearing only rifles and bayonets, running into a wall of German machine gun fire. They regain ground, lose it again, then hold a small corner of what was highly strategic territory. For two further days, they carry out a series of suicidal attacks with no hope of making significant gains, their sole but essential purpose being to bluff the Germans into thinking the Allied troops were larger and better prepared. All the while they waited desperately for reinforcements. Where you go, I will go. Where you die, Then came a second gas attack. This time the troops are trusting in the conclusions of two Canadian frontline soldiers, a corporal and a medic, that the gas was chlorine. Chlorine would dissolve in water, the soldiers were told, or better yet, urine which would neutralize the gas. And so they stand and wait, saturated handkerchiefs and rags held against their mouths, no way of knowing if these protections would suffice. Where you stay, I will stay. Where you die, I will die. There will I be buried. And they fight. And again, the Canadians held their ground. Unimaginable courage in the face of unthinkable brutality, faithfulness, outranking fear, the immense contradiction that we acknowledge each Remembrance Day that in our darkest hours, humankind can radiate the love of Jesus. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. No greater love. That's the power at the heart of our faith, the power of love, sacrificial and life-giving. In loving one another, we are honoring and loving God. We are picking up the torch from Ruth and those who've served before us, loving faithfully without counting the cost. And so we grieve the cost of war, even as we honour the loyalty and courage of those who fought. 
We pray for peace, even as we recognize that there are some things worth fighting for, values we must always defend. And we give thanks to God for God's faithful love that will never let us go. Thanks be to God. Grant us your peace by Mendelssohn. We come now to our offering. Maple Grove United Church is ever grateful for your gifts. The offerings you continue to make through your envelope givings, par, or one-time donations, or by using the Donate Now button on the website. At this time of year, we remember all those whose service has involved great sacrifices. And we give thanks for their commitment and determination. We recognize that many of the freedoms and blessings we enjoy today have come at the cost of others' struggle and suffering. And we give now as we are able to honor and give thanks for all that we have. Let us dedicate our offering together in prayer. Merciful God, 
Today we honour those who have offered up their lives in the name of service and loyalty. Through their example, encourage us to offer our lives for your service, to share our time and talents for the needs of your children. Inspire us to be faithful with our giving and to commit ourselves to the redemption of those in this world living in fear, pain or poverty. Amen. We bring before now God now the cares of our hearts and the concerns of our world. Blessed God, we come before you now in prayer to participate in an act of remembrance as we recognise and acknowledge the way the world is even as we wish for it to be different. We carry with us today our grief. We remember all those lost in wars across the ages, those who returned but were deeply changed and troubled by the violence they experienced, and those whose bodies were never recovered, buried by the conditions on the front line. Loving God, bring us hope, and grant us peace. We carry with us today our fear. We pray for restraint and understanding in the face of increasing threats of war around the world, both military and economic. We pray for acceptance and tolerance to overcome the increase of prejudice. We affirm that an attack on one faith is an attack on all faiths and we pray for understanding. Loving God, bring us hope and grant us peace. We pledge our faithful commitment to stand up for the downtrodden and the outcast, those that society looks to isolate or diminish, to reach out to those in need, the hurting and the lonely, and to bring love and compassion into our communities, remembering your faithful love for each one of us. Loving God, enable us to be bringers of hope and agents of peace. In Jesus' name we pray, remembering and striving to follow his commandment that we love one another. Amen and hear us now as we pray in the words that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We sing now our closing hymn, God make us servants of your peace. Voices United, number 676.
Go now in peace. Remember that where you go, God is with you, and where you stay, God can use you. May you be strengthened in the hope that comes from the love of God and the sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.
thank you for being part of this Zoom service. Please stay tuned for details regarding next Sunday as you will be welcoming your new minister, Jessica. It has been a pleasure worth shipping with you over these past months and God bless.